In this section, we will cover the remaining part of Chapter 12. Your book talks about action potential, and I have left a video for you guys to review. It's approximately 14 minutes just to go over the action potential that occurs within a neuron. So please take some time out and review that, that video. So we'll move on talking about the synapses. Now, a synapse is, exists at the end of an axon. In synapses between two neurons, the first neuron is the presynaptic neuron, and the second is the postsynaptic neuron. With the presynaptic neuron, it releases um, neurotransmitters. And the second is the postsynaptic, and that is the one that responds to the neurotransmitter. Now these synapses, they tr trigger the release of neurotransmitters, and they also stimulate a new wave of electrical activity in the next cell across the synapse. So here, we're going to look at the diagram. Here is your presynaptic neuron. And here is your postsynaptic neuron. Here are your various vesicles that will carry the, um, the neurotransmitters and your various um, channels on the presynaptic neuron. On the postsynaptic, you're going to have receptors that are going to receive the neurotransmitter that's being released. And then it'll travel to the, um, the postsynaptic neuron. Now, a presynaptic neuron may have, may form an axodendritic, an um, axosomatic, or an axoexonic synapsis. So the axodendritic is, um, is a synapse between the dendrites. The axosomatic is um, a synapse between the soma, and the axoexonic is a synapse between the, the axon. Hence the names. Now, a neuron can have an enormous number of synapses. A spinal motor neuron carried, covered um, by about 10,000 synaptic norms from other neurons. You have 8,000 ending on its dendrites and 2,000 ending on its soma. So here on this slide, we're going to look at the different um, forms of, of um, the presynaptic neuron. For example, here's your presynaptic neuron and here's your synapse. And of course the signal is traveling from left to right and hence your postsynaptic neuron that will receive that information. In B, you're going to have an axodendritic synapse where you have the, uh, the axon, um, the end of the axon or the synaptic cleft um, close to the um, the dendrite or synapsing with the dendrite and your axon somatic synapse that would um, synapse with the the soma and of course your axon axonic that will synapse with your axon so those are the three visual aspects of your three forms of presynaptic neurons Now when we look at the synaptic cleft, cleft is a gap between neurons and it was discovered by Raymond Y. Pajal through historical discoveries. But then back in 1931, no later than that, um, Otto Louis, he demonstrated that neurons communicated by releasing chemicals through this connect, um, synaptic, through the chemical synapse. Now he tested two frogs frog hearts and he exposed them and he flooded them with saline. Now when he stimulated the vagal nerve of the first frog, the heart started to slow down. Then when he removed the saline from that first frog, he found that it slowed down the heart of the second one. And he termed it as vagus um, substance. Then he later re renamed it acetylcholine, which was that very first known neurotransmitter.
Now, electrical synapses do exist. We have some neurons, uh, neuroglia, and cardiac, and single unit um, smooth muscle. We do have these um, electrical synapses. They have gap junctions that join adjacent cells. The ions diffuse through the gap junctions from one cell to the next. Now the advantage of having such a quick transmission is that there's no delay for release and binding of the neurotransmitter. And we have examples would be the cardiac and the smooth muscle and some neurons. But there's a disadvantage. The disadvantage is that they cannot integrate information and make decisions. They, um, the ability is uh, reserved for chemical synapses in which neurons communicate by releasing neurotransmitters. Now the structure of a chemical synapse includes the synaptic knob, which is a part of the presynaptic neuron that contains the synaptic vesicles. You know, many of the presynaptic neuron vesicles are docked at the membrane, while others far away constitute a, res a reserve pool. The postsynaptic yeah, the postsynaptic neuron has no synaptic vesicles in the synapse and cannot release neurotransmitters. The membrane does not or cannot the membrane does contain receptor proteins and ligand and ligand related sorry and ligand regulated ion gates. So here in this diagram the structure of the chemical synapse. Here we have the axon. You know, the top at the bottom here is our synaptic knob which would be our, um, our presynaptic neuron. And down here, we'll have our postsynaptic neuron. And this gap between the two is that synaptic cleft. There are our vesicles containing the synaptic vesicles, containing the neurotransmitters. And here are the receptors for these neurotransmitters, right on the membrane of the, of the synaptic postsynaptic neuron. Now more than a hundred confirmed or suspected neurotransmitters have been identified. That's, that's a lot. Now neurotransmitters fall into four major categories according to composition. We have acetylcholine, amino acid, uh, monoamines, and then we have neuropeptides. Now with the acetylcholine, it's in a class by itself and it's formed from acidic acid and and choline. The amino acid and neurotransmitters, they include um, glycine, um, glutamate, aspir aspirate, and GABA, which is our gamma amino butyric acid. Third one is their monoamines. They are synthesized from, from amino acids by removal of the um, carboxyl group. The major amino acids are epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, histamine, and serotonin. The first three are in a subclass called um, catecholamines. Our epinephrine, norepinephrine, and our catecholamines. I mean, and our dep and our dopamines. Fourth group is our neuropeptides. Neuropeptides, they're chains of two to four amino acids, and the um, they're typically they typically act in lower concentrations and have longer lasting effects than other neurotransmitters and are stored in in larger um, secretory um, granules. Now they also have a function as hormones or as neuromodulators. Now some are produced but not only by neurons but also by the digestive tract. Now the neurotransmitters 
they're synthesized by the presynaptic neuron. Then they're released in response to a particular stimulation. Uh, stimulation. Then when they're released, they cross that synaptic clef and they bind to the, to the receptors on the postsynaptic cell. With that, they're going to alter the physiology of that particular cell. Now, a given, a, new, a given neurotransmitter does not have the same effect everywhere in the body. Multiple receptors, receptor types exist for a particular neurotransmitter. So we have 14 receptor types for serotonin, which is a type of um, neurotransmitter. Now, a receptor governs the effect the neurotransmitter has on that particular cell. Neurotransmitters are diverse in their action. Some are excitatory, some inhibitory, and some, the effect depends on what kind of receptor um, the postsynaptic cell has. Some hold li ligated, uh, regulated ion gates, and some act through second messenger systems. Now hopefully you understand what ligated means. When they say ligated, I mean, sorry, ligand gated ion channels, they're referring to a group of transmembrane ion channel proteins which open to allow certain ions through. Okay. All right, so neurotransmitters, they have diverse actions. The three examples of different modes of action are illustrated by the excitatory um, cholinergic synapse, an inhibitory um, GABBA eric synapse, and an excitatory adrogenic synapse. Now the synaptic delay is the time from arrival of a signal at the axon terminal of a presynaptic cell to the beginning of an action potential in the postsynaptic cleft. So that's when that signal arrives just right at that terminal and then right before, um, right at the beginning of when the neurons, uh, the neurotransmitters have crossed that cleft and have binded to the receptors at the beginning there. That's a, considered that synaptic delay and that's approximately um, 0.5 milliseconds for all the complex sequences of events to occur. Now the excitatory cholinergic synapse, it employs the acetylcholine as its, um, as its, sorry, as its neurotransmitter. And it follows a number of steps. When we look at the steps in figure uh, 12.22, we see here that we have the arrival of a nerve signal at the synaptic knob. So here's our synaptic knob. So we have a particular signal that's going to arrive at the synaptic knob. And when that signal arrives there, it's going to open the vaulted regulated calcium channel gates. Now the calcium enters the knob and then it triggers the exocytosis of the synaptic vessels releasing the acetylcholine. So of course we're going to have these acetyl, so we have the calcium entering into the channels, channel gates into the, the presynaptic ion and we have these um, acetylcholine within these vesicles. So once the calcium enters in, it's going to trigger the release of them to the exo exocytosis stage, releasing them through through the um, through the um, synaptic cleft. Now the empty vesicles are going to drop back into the um, cytoplasm to be refilled, and the synaptic vesicles in the reserve pool move to the active sites, and they're going to release the acetylcholine. Now acetylcholine, they're going to diffuse across the cleft and bind to the ligand regulated gates. 
which are going to open to allow sodium to enter the cell and potassium to leave. Now sodium spreads out along the inside, spreads out along the inside of the membrane, um, producing a local potential called the postsynaptic potential. Now if it's strong and persistent enough, this triggers an action potential. Now, an inhibitory GABB ergic synapse, it employs a gamma um, amino butyric acid as its neurotransmitter. So the release of the GABA by the presynaptic neuron and its binding to the ion gates um, is a similar mechanism as for the um, color cholinergic synapse, like the synapse that we just previously talked about. It's very similar to it. Now the GABA receptor, however, is a chloride channel. And when it opens, the chloride enters the cell, as you see here, it enters the cell, and it increases the negative membrane potential, then inhibiting any type of firing. So it's going to, pre it's going to prevent anything from being signaled to the remaining parts of the of the neuron. And I have the the description of what I was just talking about, the inhibitory GABA ergic synapse. The third one is our excitatory um, adrenergic adrenergic synapse. And that one is going to employ um, norepinephrine, which is one of our catacombs, norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter. Its receptor is not, a, not an ion gate, but a transmembrane protein associated with the G protein in a second membrane system. What else is going to, the binding of the neurotransmitter, uh, sorry, the binding of the um, norepinephrine to the receptor causes the G protein to dissociate from it. So here's our G protein and here's our neurotransmitter. Once the um, neuro, once the norepinephrine binds to the receptor, it causes this uh, G protein to be released. Now once it's released, the, the G protein binds to the adenylate cyclase, which is an enzyme, um, inducing it to convert ATP to cyclic um, AM, AMP. ATP, which we should know is a, um, adenosine triphosphate, and AMP, we should know as um, adenosine monotriphate, not monophosphate, sorry. Now, cyclic AMP can induce several alternative effects inside of the cell. One effect is to produce an internal chemical that binds to a ligand regulated ion gate from inside the membrane, opening the gate. Another is to activate pre-existing cytoplasmic enzymes that affect metabolism. The last one is yet another is to induce genetic transcription so that new enzymes are produced. And here on this, on the next slide, you will see a description of what occurs in that particular figure, in figure 12.23. Now, cessation of signals occurs when neurotransmitter stops being released and when neurotransmitter already present on um, already present in such a threat is is uh, removed now the cessation of action potentials in the presynaptic nerve fiber stops the release of the neurotransmitter now the removal of neurotransmitter from the synaptic cleft is occurred in three ways we have diffusion, reuptake, and degradation. Now with diffusion, 
the neurotransmitter leaves the synapse and enters the extracellular fluid. Now, in the central nervous system, the astrocytes, they absorb it and then return it to the neurons. With retake, re, sorry, re, reuptake, the synaptic knob reabsorbs amino acids and monoamines by endocytosis and breaks them down with monoamines, with, mono, with monoamine um, oxidase, which is an enzyme. Now the last one is degradation, and that's when the enzyme acetyl, acetylcholine, acetylcholine esterase it breaks down the acetylcholine into um, acetate and choline. And then the choline is going to be reabsorbed by the synaptic knob. Now we have neuromodulators. Neuromodulators are hormones, neuropeptides, and other messengers that modify synaptic tr transmission. Now, they may stimulate neuron to install more receptors in the postsynaptic membrane, adjusting its sensitivity to the to the neurotransmitter. They may alter the, the rate of neurotransmitter synthesis, um, release, reuptake, and as well as the breakdown. Now we have um, encephalins, and that is also in the neuromodulator family. Those are um, small peptides and they that inhibit um, spinal neural new um, interneurons from transmitting pain signals to the brain then we have um, nitric oxide which is a similar new um, neural modulator and um, it's a gas that's released by the postsynaptic neurons in some areas of the brain and here it stimulates the presynaptic neuron to release more neurotransmitter. Now one, one, neural, new, one neuron's way of telling the other to give me more. And some chemical communication that goes backward against, sorry, across the synapse. Now the, synapt the synaptic delays, it slows the transmission of these nerve signals. The more synapse in the neural pathway, the longer it takes for transmission to get from one from its ori from its origin, sorry, to its destination. Now synapses are not due to the limitation of nerve fibers length. They have gap junction gap junctions that allow some cells to communicate more rapidly than chemical synapse. Alright, so why do we even have synapse? It's, it's to process information, to store it, and of course, to make decisions. You know, chemical synapses are the decision-making devices of the nervous system. The more synapses an, a neuron has, the greater its information process the greater its information processing capabilities. The um, pyramidal, pyramidal, sorry, pyramidal cells in the cerebral cortex, they have about 40,000 synaptic contacts with other neurons. And the cerebral cortex has an estimated 100 trillion synapses. Now the ability of neurons to process information, store it, and recall it and make decisions is called a neural integration. Neural integration is based on the postsynaptic potentials um, produced by neurotransmitters. Sorry. Now, any voltage change that, rise, that rises the memory potential closer to the, to the threshold is termed, the, is termed um, excitatory post-synaptic potential. Any voltage change that hyperpolarizes the membrane and makes it more negative 
Then the resting memory potential is termed an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, IPSP. Now because, an ion, because of ion leakage, all neurons fire at a certain background rate even when not been stimulated. The EPSP, which is excitatory postsynaptic potential, and the IPSP, the inhibitory postsynaptic potential, only change the rate of firing. The glutamate and aspirate produce this EPSP, and the glycine and GABA, they produce the IPSP, our inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Now acetylcholine and, and um, norepinephrine, those are the excitatory, um, those are excitatory for some cells and they also inhibit. So they play both sides. Now here we have an example of the EPS, the EPSP, and the IPSP. So hopefully you guys are going to review this particular diagram within your textbook. I believe it would be figure 12.24 uh, that you will see in your textbook. Where you see this is the first one where we have the, um, the voltage change that will arise the member retention closer to the threshold. Here's your threshold. You have that voltage that would raise that member potential very close to that threshold. And this is what's called this EPSP, the excitatory um, postsynaptic potential. But our IPSP is, it will be our inhibitory. And that's going to be having a voltage which, is, which hyperpolarizes the membrane and making it more negative than the rest of the potential. So it's going to be going in the opposite direction. So you see it's getting more negative. Now one neuron can receive input from thousands of other neurons. Some incoming neurofibers may produce EPSPs while others may produce IPSPs. Neuron's response depends on whether the net input is excitatory or if it's inhibitory. Now, summation is the process of adding up postsynaptic potentials and responding to their net effect. And it occurs in the trigger zone. Hopefully you remember where the trigger zone is. The trigger zone is um, right by the, it occurs in the axon hillux. Now the balance between the EPSPs and the IPSPs enables the nervous system to make decisions. We have the temporal summation and that occurs when a single synapse regulates the EPSP so quickly that each is generated before the previous one fades. And this will allow EPSPs to add up over time to a threshold voltage that will trigger this action potential. So we're going to have a lot of them adding up in order just for this action total just to start. Now the spatial summation that occurs when the EPSPs have several different synapses that will add up to the threshold at an, at an axon helix. For this you're going to have several synapses that will admit enough sodium to reach this particular threshold that's needed. And the presynaptic neurons, they're going to uh, cooperate to induce the postsynaptic neuron to fire. So here we have an example of the temporal and the spatial um, summation. Here we have um, the intense stimulation by one presynaptic neuron. And then triggering the, the EPSPs, they're going to spread from one synapse 
to the to the trigger zone, getting our presynaptic um, neuron to start firing. But in the spatial, the spatial is when we're going to have um, stimulation um, by several different um, presynaptic clefts, presynaptic neurons, causing um, a spread from several synapses to the particular trigger zone. Then it's going to cause the postsynaptic neuron to fire. So in this diagram here, here we have um, stimuli, we have our EPEs that are being produced, we have our action potential, and we have our threshold, and as well as our resting membrane. So of course, we, at first it's at its resting membrane. When we get the stimuli, the several types of stimuli that are produced is going to produce at least one action potential, sorry, one EPSPs. Now if there's enough EPSPs that arrive at this trigger zone, um, faster than they start to fade away, then they can build up on each other and start to bring the neuron to a threshold and then trigger this action potential. Now, summation, facilitation, and inhibition are mechanisms that influence a neuron's integration of multiple inputs. Now, summation, which we talked about, is the process of adding up our EPE, our EPS, our ESPSs, and our ISPSs, and uh, responding to their net effort, and it occurs in that trigger zone. Uh, facilitation is a process in which one neuron enhances the effect of another. For example, when two neurons working on co cooperatively are able to induce firing. Now, the presynaptic inhibit in, in, inhibit inhibitation inhibiting sorry inhi inhibition sorry is a mechanism by which one presynaptic neuron suppresses the action of another, often by blocking with an inhibitory neural receptor. So here we have our ESPS, we have our neurotransmitters, but in here there's no new transmitter that's being released. So at this point it's blocking any type of in, um, inhibitory neuron. And releasing any type of um, neurotransmitters. Now the way in which the nervous system converts information to a meaningful pattern of action potential is called neural coding. The most important mechanism is the labeled line code. Each nerve fiber is the brain each nerve fiber to the brain leads from a receptor that recognizes a, that recognized a uh, particular stimulus type, such as the optic nerve fibers. They're going to carry signals only from light receptors in the eye. Now, quantitative information um, it um, quantitative information about intensity of stimuli is encoded in two ways in recruitment another one is mechanism within recruitment um, we have additional neurons are brought into play as a stimulus becomes stronger enabling the nervous system to judge stimulus strength by which by sorry by which and by how many neurons are firing so it's all going to depend on which ones are going to fire, and of course, how many are firing. The second me mechanism would be um, 
another mechanism it depends on on the fact that the more strongly a neuron is stimulated the more frequently it's going to fire so that the neural nervous system can judge stimulus strength from the firing frequency of afferent neurons so the absolute refractory period sets an upper limit to how often a neuron can fire the, theor the theoretical limit of firing frequency is 2,000 action potentials per second, but the highest frequencies observed are 500 to 1,000 per second. Now here we look at the um, neurons function in assemblies called neural pools, which may, con which may contain thousands to millions of interneurons. The function of the inter of the neural neural pool are partially determined by its neural circuit. Here they're going to control the the rhythm of breathing, moving limbs rhythmatically when walking. The information arrives at a neural pool through one or more input neurons. Now within the discard zone of an input neuron, that neuron can make the postsynaptic cells fire. In a broader facilitated zone, the neural synapse will still, with, with still other neurons in the pool, can stimulate them only with the assistance of other input neurons. A, a neural pool's neural circuit consists of the pathways among its neurons. A wide variety of neural functions result from the operation of four kinds, four principal kinds of neural circuits. So we have diverging units, converging units, um, re reverb reverb reverberating circuits, and parallel after discard circuits. So let's look at diverging circuits. Diverging circuits is one nerve fiber that branches in the synapses with several pulse synaptic cells so that input from one neuron may produce output through hundreds of neurons. The converging unit circuit is input from many different nerve fibers um, is funneled to one neuron or a neural pool. This type of circuit it allows input from different sensory systems to be evaluated, such as um, correcting our balance. The revertebrating circuits, neurons are stimulated in a linear fashion, but some have an axon calibrating uh, collateral sorry, leading back to the initial neuron and re re um re stimulates it and we're looking at the diaphragm or also the intercostal muscles the parallel after discharge um discharge circuits it's a, it um within that particular circuit you have an input um input neurons they diverge to stimulate several neuron chains that eventually reconverge on a single output neuron these change these chains uh different in total synaptic delay, meaning that their signals arrive on the input neuron at different times. Now there's there is no feedback loop and all and once all the um, neurons are fired have fired output is ceased. Now the output neuron may continue to fire after the stimulus stops as signals continue to arrive. So let's take a look at the four types of um, circuits. The divergent. We have one nerve fiber and it starts to branch off from different uh, several pulses of synaptic flux, synaptic cells, so that the input from one neuron may produce output through hundreds of neurons. Okay, so we're starting with one. And the convergent, what do we have here? 
we have um, input from different neurons. So here are neurons here. A lot of input from different neurons. Input from different neurons, I'm sorry. Then it's funneled down having into just one type of neuron. This is our output. So we have input from several neurons and it's funneled down into just one. Where one neuron is is, is um giving output signals what I mean output signals to the particular target. So we have the revertebrating. Revertebrating we have neurons are stimulated in a linear fashion. So here's our neurons here. All getting stimulated in a linear fashion. But then some will have an axon that will um that will correlate leading back to the initial. So that some of them will actually branch off leading back to the initial um neuron to re stimulate it. And then our last one is our parallel after discharge. This is where we have um, that input neuron here that will diverge to simulate several neurons to, to eventually um, reconverge on a single output of, um, of neuron. So we start off with one, it branches off and starts to stimulate other neurons, but eventually start to reroute and stimulate just this one neuron. So we get one in, we get an output just from one particular neuron. Now the physical basis of memory is a pathway through the brain called a memory trace or an ingram. It is based on the ability of synapse to be added, taken away, or modified, which is called synaptic plasticity. Now during learning, uh, synapses in a, in, a, in a certain pathway become modified so that signals travel more easily across them. And this is called uh, synaptic poten potentiation. So what kinds of memory do we have? We have immediate, short term, and we have our long term memory. Now with immediate memory, it's one of the three classes of memory and it is the ability to hold something in mind for just a few seconds. Immediate memory is necessary for continuity of events and is especially immediate, important for reading. It might be based on, on re reverberated reverberating sorry um circuits which is the third circuit that we looked at now short-term memory it lasts from a few seconds to a few hours now some people may experience this while they're studying for an exam or test and they stick there just for a few hours until you get to the test and you actually forget that's that short-term memory now, the working memory is a form of working memory is a form of short-term memory, and that allows us to hold an idea in mind long enough just to carry out the action, such as calling telephone number we just looked up. It might even be just based on um, reverberating circuits. Now, somewhat long-lasting memories, probably. In, um, involves synaptic facilitation which is induced by tetanic stimulation where we have rapid arrival of the signals uh, means that the the, uh, the calcium accumulates in the synaptic knob then it, it causes the the SPSPs to become stronger and stronger the memories lasting for a few hours may involve um, pulse tetanic potentiation and that's where we have the chemical levels um, they stay elevated for for such a long time where it starts to signal that that another signal is released and it starts to burst out the uh, the neurotransmitter so it will start to jog the memory 
of an event for several hours later. Um, our long-term memory that lasts up to a lifetime and is less limited than the STM, which is our short-term memory, um, in the moment, in the, sorry, in the amount of information it can store. The two forms of long-term memory are declarative memory and um, procedural memory. Um, declarative memory is the retention of facts and events that can be put into words. Procedural memory is the retention of motor skills. Now some long-term memory involves physical remodeling of synapses or formation of new ones through growth. I'm sorry. Um, some long-term memory involves physical remodeling of synapses or formation of new ones through growth and um, branching of the axonal um, terminals and also the dendrites. Long-term memory can also involve long-term um, potentiation in which um, NMDA receptors that bind the, the glutamate are simultaneously subject to, to um, platonic stimulation and this will allow the entry of calcium um, as a second messenger into the um, types of cells with three effects. Okay, the neuron produces more um, NMDA receptors and it will make it more sensitive to glutamate in the future. It synthesizes proteins concerned with remodeling synthesis and um, it also releases um, nitric, acid, <laughs> nitric oxide um, which triggers more glutamate releases in the presynaptic neuron. So when we take a look at Alzheimer's disease, we, there might be some of us who know at least one or two people who may suffer from this particular um, disease, neurological disease. We know that at least 100,000 deaths occur per year from Alzheimer's disease, and that's approximately 11% of the top population over 65 years of age. And over the age of, and by the age of six of 85, we have at least 47 percent that are suffering, I mean that have died from Alzheimer's disease. Now we have memory loss for, um, for recent events, um, moody, com combative, loss of ability to talk, walk, and as well as, as, as to eat. There's some um, side effects or some symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Um, but this it will show deficiencies in acetylcholine as well as in nerve growth. Now, when diagnosed, when you confirmed um, at autopsy, and you have um, atrophy, which we know is like muscle loss of the, the various folds called the, the gyri in the cerebral cortex. And then we have formation of the beta amyloid protein from the breakdown product of these uh, plasma membranes. The type of treatment <laughs> that was done, they, they stopped the beta um, amyloid um, production and that's due to very serious um, side effects that were occurring. So here we have someone with Alzheimer's disease. It does, these folds, um, they're not supposed to be that deep but or wide but with Alzheimer's disease this is exactly what you're going to see um, if you've seen a model of a of a brain, you will notice that there is definitely a difference with the with the sulci, which are um, which are the which are the um, sorry the top parts of the folds of the brain, and then the the grooves in between is called the the gyri, and that's something in it's very deep. It's not supposed to be that deep, okay. Parkinson's disease, another neurological disease. Um, it's a progressive loss of motor function um, beginning obviously in the 50s and also in the 60s. And there is no recovery, no recovery from them 
we know that um who's some, some famous two people that I can I can't think of the top of my mind off my head. Um Michael J. Fox and the boxer. Oh that's not good. I don't remember his name, but you guys may remember it. Um that has the Oh Muhammad Ali. I'm sorry. Then we have degeneration. This comes from the degeneration of the of the di of the dopamine releasing neurons. Now dop norm the dopamine normally um prevents excessive activity in the motor centers. Um we have involuntary muscle contractions. That's where you have the shaking. Hands are, are constantly shaking, um slurred speech, um facial um rigidity. Of course, um their handwriting is not legible. What type of treatments do they have? They use drugs and physical therapy. And they use um it's a dopamine precursor which crosses the, the, the brain barriers. Now bad side effects unfortunately affect the liver and the heart, just like most of the, the drugs that are out there nowadays. Um they are gonna affect the liver and sometimes the kidneys. Now so the surgical um techniques they also to release sorry, to relieve any type of tremors. So that's the end of our chapter twelve. If you have any questions, please go to the discussion board um, and post any questions. Or if you have see anybody that have posted questions and you would like to answer it, go ahead and do so at this time. Um, also, you need to be preparing for your quiz that will be on um, Sunday. This is a 10 point quiz. So just make sure you guys go over the points, go through the PowerPoint as well as the 14 15 minute video I posted on action potential and start preparing for your quiz, I mean, your quiz, and as well as your test. Please do not procrastinate.